In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Today the Mass is offered for the people of the parish. Uh, this is a weekend in which we can celebrate the ordination of four new deacons uh, at the cathedral yesterday, and also our own graduates from St. Thomas School today, this afternoon. We approach the Ascension, which we observe in a week, and still in this Easter season, so we are filled with joy as we begin this Mass and as we turn to the Lord confident in, in our request for the forgiveness of sins. Lord Jesus, you came to reconcile us to one another and to the Father. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you heal the wounds of sin and division. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you intercede for us with the Father. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. We proclaim glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, Heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Only Begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Grant, Almighty God, that we may celebrate with heartful devo devotion these days of joy, which we keep in honor of the risen Lord, and that what we relive in remembrance we may always hold to in what we do. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Some who had come down from Judea were instructing the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the Mosaic practice, you cannot be saved. Because there arose no little dissension and debate by Paul and Barnabas with them, it was decided that Paul, Barnabas, and some of the others should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. The apostles and elders, in agreement with the whole church, decided to choose representatives to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. The ones chosen were Judas, who was called Barsabbas, and Silas, leaders among the brothers. This is the letter delivered by them. The apostles and the elders, your brothers, to the brothers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia of Gentile origin, greetings. Since we have heard that some of our number who went out without any mandate from us have upset you with their teachings and disturbed your peace of mind, we have, with one accord, decided to choose representatives and to send them to you, along with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, who have dedicated their lives to the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are sending Judas and Silas, who will also convey this same message by word of mouth. It is the decision of the Holy Spirit and of us not to place on you any burden beyond these necessities, namely, to abstain from meat sacrificed to idols, from blood, from meats of strangled animals, and from unlawful marriage. If you keep free of these, you will be doing what is right. Farewell. The word of the Lord. Amen. The responsorial psalm is, O God, let all the nations praise you. O God, let all the nations praise you. May God have pity on us and bless us. May he let his face shine upon us. So may your way be known upon earth among all nations your salvation. O God, let all the nations praise you. May the nations be glad and exult, because you rule the peoples in equity. The nations on earth you, gem, you guide. O God, let all the nations praise you. May the peoples praise you, O God. May the peoples praise you. May God bless us, and may all the ends of the earth fear him. O oh God, let all the nations praise you. A reading from the book of Revelation. 
The angel took me in spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. It gleamed with the splendor of God. Its radiance was like that of a precious stone, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a massive high wall with 12 gates where 12 angels were stationed and on which names were inscribed, the names of the 12 tribes of the Israelites. There were three gates facing east, three north, three south, and three west. The wall of the city had 12 courses of stones as its foundation, on which were inscribed the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. The city had no need of the sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gave it light, and its lamp was the Lamb, the word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever loves me will keep my word. My Father will love him. We will come to him, make our dwelling with him. Whoever does the, not love me does not keep my words. Yet the word you hear is not mine, but that of the Father who sent me. I have told you this while I am with you. The Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything, remind you of all that I have told you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give it to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. You heard me tell you, I am going away, I will come back to you. If you love me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it happens, so when it happens, you may believe. The Gospel of the Lord. The second reading that we had this Sunday is taken from Revelation, and it reminds us of the destiny to which we're called. Uh, it is a description of the heavenly court. And so we see that, this, that depiction put before us of the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. And so this is what we are called to, but let no one be deceived that somehow getting to heaven is going to be easy, or that it's automatic, or just simply a given. It is not. Otherwise, why would Jesus tell us to take the narrow path, to make sure that we remember he's like a thief in the night, be ready, be ready for when the Lord comes. We have to do that serious work of growing in our relationship with Jesus Christ so as to be worthy of heaven by God's grace. Heaven is a place of such utter perfection, and who of us has grown so much in perfection as to merit or to, do, to deserve what awaits us in heaven if it wasn't for the grace that our Lord Jesus Christ gives to us? But we have to take that seriously. St. Paul tells us to really work and to strive for our salvation running the race, fighting the good fight, uh, persevering to the end. So let us not be afraid to do that. Every one of you, by virtue of your baptism, is called to heaven, and therefore called to grow in holiness, and then to grow in our um, connection with the Lord, to turn away from sin, to put on Jesus Christ, to listen to the words of the gospel, and to do this faithfully throughout this pilgrim here below, so that we, we, we might be with the Lord forever in heaven. And it's a serious responsibility. Now, yesterday we had the ordination of some new deacons for the diocese, and so I'd like to talk a little bit about specific vocations. Suppose that your vocation is to marriage. So if, if we have married people here, so then what becomes your responsibility? 
beyond the initial vocation to holiness, which comes because of our baptism, what I just described, the call that every one of us has to grow in holiness. For those who are married, you have an extra responsibility. And that's not just simply to get yourself to heaven, but to also get your spouse to heaven. And so it becomes an extra responsibility or an obligation. And so do you know what that means? It means you get to pick on each other. <laughs> you didn't realize that's where that was going to go. I don't, know, I don't know if I like that so much anymore. No, actually, it's, a, it's an important aspect of marriage is that husbands and wives in their bond of love for one another, not only in order to be the best spouse, I think oftentimes they, then they want to be the best that they can be to grow personally, so that way I can... I, I worry not just for myself, but I want to make sure that I'm providing for my loved one, for my family, in the best way possible. So I want to be the best I can be, but also in pushing and challenging and, and in probing and so forth, so that our spouse also does the same thing. So it's not always a bad idea that you have someone who knows you uh, better than anyone else on earth who can actually give you then that kind of feedback and we have to be careful in, in all humility to take that feedback so that way we, we can grow in holiness so we can be the best we can be so we can be better than we've been before and that's a great vocation a great calling now i mentioned the deacons who were ordained they were transitional deacons so because they are to be ordained as priests god willing a year from now and so we look forward to that day but what about them so they have their own personal call to holiness as we all do but then for them, they took the promise of celibacy uh, since they are destined for the priesthood. So what about them? There's no spouse. There's no family that they're responsible for. Or is there? And this is where we get into a very important part of this vocation, is that priests are responsible not just for themselves, but also for the people entrusted to their care. So guess what that means? That means I get to pick on you, but it also means you get to pick on me as well because this is a responsibility we all have, and it's a great responsibility for priests is to, to lead all souls to heaven, to draw more people to know our Lord Jesus Christ, and that is serious business. That's a grave responsibility. Um, think about the first reading that we have today from the Acts of the Apostles. An important question had come up. The, the, I'll describe the circumstances, but remember the important context, which is that the apostles, in particular Paul and Barnabas, who we hear about today, their focus is to make sure that they lead those souls in Antioch, the Gentiles who are, have come to believe, to lead them to Christ and to get them to heaven. This is the task that is set before them. So how best to do that? Well, in this particular passage, there is a conflict that arose because they said, what is the right way to live? How, do, how are we expected to live our life as Christians? And are we required, for example, to keep the Mosaic Law, including the Mosaic obligation of, circ of circumcision? So they were debating that. Is that important? Is that necessary? Is that required for salvation? So they debate the question. They go to Jerusalem, discuss it with the apostles. They send back their decision in a letter, uh, not only with Paul and Barnabas, but also with Judas and Silas to deliver the message to the Christians, to the Gentile Christians in Antioch. And this is the answer that is given. And there are three important things, I think, that come from this. So first, they're told that uh, they, the, it is the decision of the Holy Spirit and of us, it's interesting that they speak for the Holy Spirit there, um, not to place on you any burden beyond these necessities. And then they go on to say what those necessities are. So there are three critical things. Number one, that the community in Antioch believes very deeply in Jesus Christ. And that is the first and most essential qualification for their growth and holiness and for preparing them for heaven. They need to belong to Jesus Christ. And they are already converted to Jesus Christ. They belong to him. They are on fire for him. They have received the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They want to live out their life according to the right way to live. So not only are the apostles' responsibility, which Paul and Barnabas have already done, is to introduce them to Jesus and to strengthen their faith in Jesus. But then beyond that, the second thing is that Paul is then seeking to remove any obstacles that stand in their way. His job is to help them along the way, and not to let them be held back by any obstacles. And that's why they speak about not placing on you any burden beyond that which is necessary. Not the burden of the Mosaic Law, not the burden of circumcision, that's not required. That is not required for salvation. So notice that he removes the things that stand in the way, and that's an important function. 
Believe in Jesus and let me remove that which would be an obstacle or a hindrance to you. But then third, he also reminds them, though, that you do need to keep to those things that are essential or those things that are necessary. And he pulls out essentially three areas. He speaks to them about the idea of abstaining from meat sacrificed to idols, abstaining from blood and the meat of strangled animals with their blood still in it, and then from unlawful marriage. What do we make of these three things? So that's, it seems like kind of an odd list of things for him to say. Now, these are the essentials. Circumcision, you can set aside. You don't need to keep that. But here are the essentials. Think of it this way. First and foremost, abstain from any contact with idols. Idolatry is a very dangerous thing. You believe in Jesus Christ. Do not let any false gods stand before our Lord Jesus Christ. It's an important, important lesson. Yes, it comes from the Ten Commandments, but you might say it's so fundamental that to worship God means that we worship him alone. Don't let anything else get in the way. There's a great responsibility for the apostles, indeed the responsibility for any priest, is to call people to believe in Jesus Christ and to keep anything that might contaminate that belief from leading you astray. There's great danger there when we start to put anything ahead of our Lord Jesus Christ. He comes first. Don't compromise on that. That's an essential. That's number one. Secondly, it's interesting that then he points out blood and the meat of strangled animals. This goes back not to Moses. This goes back not to Abraham. This goes back all the way to Noah, to the covenant with Noah from Genesis chapter 9. There was a time at which after the flood, then God spoke about not destroying life any longer. So an animal with its life blood in it is sacred to the Lord. And so um, it's a responsibility that was uh, given that uh, lifeblood should always be kept and held sacred and hallowed. And in particular, your lifeblood, Noah, God would say, that of the lifeblood of man, I shall demand an accountant, that life is sacred. It's interesting that here is one of the, those considered essential elements is that we respect that gift of life and how important that is as well. I'd say that's just as important today as it was 2,000 or even 4,000 years ago. That the idea that we stand for the value of human life, that is considered an essential value. And it's important for us not to compromise that. We can't stand up and say that we belong to the Lord if at the same time we also advocate the taking of innocent human life. Those are utterly contradictory positions and we cannot stand on both sides of that fence. The third thing, he says, keep from unlawful marriage. It's interesting there that marriage is also one of those things that is held up as one of those essential, necessary elements. That in that fidelity between husband and wife, we see a reflection of the fidelity between us and God. That as Jesus Christ is the bridegroom and the church is his bride, so marriage is also to be a reflection of that divine love for us when he calls us into that covenant of love. So marriage becomes an important thing, that uh, divine institution created from the beginning, the union of man and woman, out of that complementarity comes new life. And so that also is an essential element. So it's interesting that these characteristics are put before us. It's a responsibility, we could say, translating this now to our own time. The priest would also need to have the courage to do those three things of introducing the faithful to Christ, removing the obstacles that might stand in the way, don't, don't get caught up in the things that are unimportant or not necessary for salvation. But of those things that are necessities, hold fast to them. And so priests have to have the courage to talk about those things and to call people to really hold to those necessities. When we think about the things that are really central and obligatory, think about not letting anything get in the way of our relationship with Jesus Christ, the centrality of making sure we make time for him on the Lord's day, coming to Mass, I mean, the confession periodically, these are important things, and they're not optional. They're not things that can just be lightly set aside as if they're unimportant. Those are the critical things. That's part of maintaining our lifeline with our Lord Jesus Christ, and that is an important thing. When we think about those men to be ordained as priests, he says, if you want just someone who's going to just do it in a half-hearted way, go to seminary and have some fun, and oh, maybe study a little, and then get ordained, and oh, and then be around, and say some nice words to you. Is that, is that what you want? No, that's not what you want. No, you, you want someone who's going to push you, right? That's the important thing. Think, for example, if you, uh, if you had a doctor and the doctor was to tell you, he says, well, you can keep smoking. It probably won't hurt you that much, right? What would you say to that doctor? 
You'd say, no, doctor, you're, no, that's crazy. You should be pushing me. You should be pushing me not to do that because this is something that's bad for my health. And if you had a doctor who told you it wasn't bad for his health, you say, well, you're lying to me, doctor. So that's not a good doctor. Don't go to that doctor. Don't listen to that doctor. Uh, if you had someone who was your financial advisor, and he says, well, I just want to make sure I'm prepared for retirement. And he says, well, you know, you really don't need to put that much money aside. You're probably going to be okay. Probably. Yeah, would that fill you with confidence? Or do you think, oh, am I going to be okay in retirement? Will I be taken care of if I have someone who, who's going to give me half-hearted advice and tell me it will probably work out? You don't want someone like a priest who's preparing you for eternity to say, it'll probably be okay. No, that's not good advice that is there. Or if you think about, if you have a, an accountant who's doing your taxes, do you want someone who's going to tell you, the IRS will probably accept this deduction? Does that, does that fill you with confidence? <laughs> Probably not. So, so sometimes in a lot of things, we take it very seriously that, no, we want someone who's going to give us that truthful advice and someone who's going to push us and challenge us to do that which is right, and we should expect the same from our priests. Um, one of the great privileges that comes for those called to the priesthood is to be invited to do this work, and it's important work. But I will say this, if there's someone here who's called to the priesthood, if you're not serious about it, you're not really going to take this call seriously. If you're not really going to grow personally in holiness and be ready to call others to do the same, do yourself and the church a favor and do not go to seminary. More harm will be done if you did. So, but, so there, that's a serious business there when we think about the idea of really taking up that call to preach the gospel and to do it faithfully. Well, if it's that serious, think about how dangerous this is. Who would have the courage to do this? And who would have the courage to embrace such a vocation with all of that weighty responsibility? Well, if it wasn't for the gospel that we heard today and the promise that Jesus gives us, he says, keep my word. We have the word that Jesus speaks to us, which he has told us from the Father. We have the gift of the Holy Spirit. I will send the advocate, the Holy Spirit, to remind you of everything that I told you. And then he tells them, be at peace. Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. This is one of the things that can allow, I think, a priest to be at peace, is knowing that it's not my responsibility to create the gospel or figure out the gospel. No, it's already been given to us. All I have to do is announce the word that Jesus has proclaimed, to listen to the guidance and the voice of the Holy Spirit, to do so with courage and with conviction, confident that this is important words, these are the important words that guide us to salvation, and in this, we can be at peace. The words we hear just after the Our Father, peace I leave you, my peace I give you, these were words taken right out of today's gospel. Let us be at peace if we know that we stand with Christ, and we don't let anything else get in the way, Don't we don't put Christ in second place behind anything else on earth. We take seriously this call, our personal call to grow in holiness, and then the responsibility that we have to witness also to one another. Let us stand to profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. 
I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And let us present our prayers and petitions. For the Pope and bishops of the church, that they may fearlessly and clearly teach the Catholic faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For true and lasting peace in the world, the peoples of all nations may work for justice. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who are troubled or afraid in mind or heart, that their anxiety and worry may be turned into peace and happiness. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the Holy Spirit may come anew into our community, that we may take up a new evangelization. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who have been parted from us in death, that they may enter the new Jerusalem, radiant with the light of the Lamb of God, especially Jim Barkley. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those men who are just ordained and for those who will graduate this afternoon, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear And for the protection of our religious liberties, we pray. St. Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the divine power of God, <clears throat> cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who roam throughout the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Almighty and merciful God, hear and answer these prayers that we make in faith, for we ask them through Christ our Lord. Great brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Amen. May our prayers rise up to you, O Lord, together with the sacrificial offerings, so that purified by your graciousness, we might be conformed to the mysteries of your mighty love, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, at all times to acclaim you, O Lord, but in this time, above all, to laud you yet more gloriously, when Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. Through him the children of light rise to eternal life, and the halls of the heavenly kingdom are thrown open to the faithful. For his death is our ransom from death, and in his rising the life of all has risen. Therefore, overcome with paschal joy, every land, every people exalts in your praise, and even the heavenly powers with the angelic hosts sing together the unending hymn of your glory as they acclaim. Holy, 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 heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The Mystery of Faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we, who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son, and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. Rita of Cassia, St. Thomas, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth. With your servant, Francis our Pope, and Louis our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. With Let us offer each other a sign of peace. Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who restore us to eternal life in the resurrection of Christ, increase in us, we pray, the fruits of this Paschal Sacrament, and pour into our hearts the strength of this saving food, through Christ our Lord. Amen. We appreciate your contributions in support of the parish, through the, those left in the purple basket. Uh, let us also uh, pray for those uh, who take communion to the homebound. Almighty God, bless those who carry the body of Christ to our absent brothers and sisters. May this sacrament and our union of prayer be a source of strength for them. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And let us also ask the Blessed Virgin Mary not only to watch over those who are called to the priesthood, for those who are ordained uh, to the priesthood, uh, but also for holy priests. And we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God.